Welcome to Chapter 4, Pedestal, Loom, and Auction Block. The year is 1800 to 1860. This time period indicates the ideology of true womanhood. True womanhood pertained to northern and southern white privileged women that displayed characteristics of purity, Christian values, and pious ways. So here in the picture we have, let me get my pointer out really quickly, we have a woman, she is in the domestic sphere, sitting, looking up to her husband, and her husband dominates because he's the one standing. And she's there watching over her baby like she should, and she looks very pure and innocent. That is what encapsulated the concept of this true womanhood. It did exclude the woman worker and the black female slave. And we'll get, uh, as we go through the lecture, the time period of the 19th century marks the Industrial Revolution. Essentially, the Industrial Revolution was the time period of the invention of new machines that led to quicker productivity and transportation. So for example, Trains connected people over long distances cheaper and quicker than ever before. Another example are factories that allowed the output of product produced in mass manufacturing. So certain things that took maybe a hundred workers a certain amount of time and, and quality to make you have this mass production of it instead of let's say a hundred workers it only took ten workers this led to um, an increase in the population and the middle class was now more wealthy than before so in, the, in other words middle class white women who are privileged these these women who displayed true womanhood had additional money because it was good times, good economic times. The manufacturing and the industrial revolution that came allowed for um, greater economic times. And whenever you have greater economic times and good financial times, that means that people will spend more money and have more children. Um, it, chapter, I believe it's chapter six, we're going to watch the movie A Doll's House, or you also have the option to read the book. And everything I'm displaying right now of the qualities of the ideology of true womanhood are truly displayed with the character Nora. Um, so keep that in mind when we do get to the chapter. But there was a population explosion, and also because you now have job opportunities for people um, in the cities as well. So we see a shift from, in general, from the farm to the city. So mom, dad, and kids who were on the farm doing agricultural work now had the opportunity to go to the big city. And now, instead of mom being at home, taking care of the kids, um, possibly doing other duties, including uh, churning the butter, preparing the food, which was an arduous process, um, the list goes on and on. The dad, head of the household. Now, with the Industrial Revolution, in general, those families that moved from the farm to the city took on a whole different role. Um, in general, in these working class families, mom worked, dad worked, kids worked in the factory. There are no child labor laws um, in the early 19th century when this, when this occurred. What you also have in general are single, young women and men leaving the farm to go to the city for new opportunities, working in the factories together. Uh-oh. Single young women and single young men? Well, back on the farm, everybody knew everybody, and um, Christian purity was very important. So the fact that young women were on their own, living on their own, making their own money, and working side by side by single men or even married men 
Ooh, very dangerous. And that brings me to our next slide. In the age of the Industrial Revolution, there were multiple views of the woman worker. And I'm going to tell you that the stereotypes were not so great. Immoral. Women workers were seen as immoral and their immorality would be transmitted to the next generation. It was not their place to work with men in factories. It was not their place to be out there in the open working. Bad moms. Well, if moms are out working, who's taking care of the kids? Who's, who's teaching them patriotic values? Ooh, bad wives. Without a wife at the home, husbands were driven to alcoholism. These working women were a danger to society because they lured uh, single men to irrational passions, even husbands. They, the woman worker, was the representation of the perils in society. She represented poverty, protest, and the burden of family life. So during this age of the Industrial Revolution, factory owners took on the role of being the parent. So because these young women were in the factory workplace, in the city, away from mom and dad, um, you know, most likely, uh, you know, mom and dad weren't there to watch over her and her morality and her values. Um, and so it, you'll see in a little bit in the clip with Fantine from Les Miserables how the factory owner views her and her morality and what the consequences for that. Prostitution um, was often what women turned to to make additional money to make ends meet. They were living on their own. They weren't uh, making what they should have financially. They were underpaid. Um, the view of it was very bad because prostitutes were taking the husband away from the home and breaking down the nuclear family structure. Um, prostitutes were riddled with all kinds of sexual diseases. They were having babies out of wedlock from prostitution. So the view of it wasn't good. So all of the above is displayed in this short clip showing the character Fantine, played by Uma Thurman, in Les Miserables. So I'm going to play it in the next slide, um, and then I'm going to discuss it with you. She's got the military fever. They need 40 francs for medicine or 
So um, what you have is Fantine. She is an example or representation um, of some of the cases of what women workers went through. Um, young. So continue, continuing on this theme of um, female workers in the workplace, we have the Lowell, Massachusetts Mill Girls. The Lowell Mill was the first in the United States to transform raw cotton into cotton cloth in one building um, by mass producing it with machines known as power looms. So clothing that had been produced back in the day in the domestic sphere by women was now being mass produced in the factory and this is just one example in Lowell, Massachusetts. Young women were recruited under false pretenses. The men recruited young women between the ages of 16 and 35, um, telling them that they would receive high wages. Well, that really wasn't the case. But by the year 1840, the factories had employed almost 8 thousand workers. Again, mostly women between the ages of 16 and 35. Factory conditions were terrible. The employees worked from about 5 in the morning until 7 o'clock in the afternoon, which meant that they had an average of 73 hours per week that they had to work. The women experienced extreme heat there was uh, there were no windows to make sure that they had um, airflow or to get any air into the building. Um, many of them became deaf because the machines were extremely noisy, and there was a case in which one girl actually was scalped because her hair got caught in the machine. Um, the air was filled with particles of thread and cloth that were dangerous to breathe in, and the list goes on. This led to the Lowell Mill girls uh, actually striking. They held several strikes in which they sent petitions advocating for better work day and for better work conditions. Um, so again, that view of the the woman worker as being this kind of like this danger to society, well, there you go. You have women striking. They're, they're, they're working and they're striking. Obscene. So shifting to, uh, we've been talking about true womanhood, who was excluded. Well, the woman worker was excluded because she definitely wasn't viewed as pious and chaste and moral. And the same held true in society in the view of the black female slave. Female slaves, 90% of them were working um, in the cotton field. They raised sugar. Um, a lot of them did tobacco and rice. But the other 10% were in the domestic sphere as nannies, um, uh, as maids, and so on and so forth. And this, uh, nine times out of 10, led to sexual exploitation um, by the slave master. <sighs> Just to give you a little idea of how they were sexually exploited, um, Women would be whipped with their skirts up so that their private parts got the the worse of the whipping, and it was like supposed to embarrass them um, and really degrade them in the worst way possible. They also oftentimes were raped um, or had some sort of relationship with the master, and this was an open secret. Um, in fact, there have been indications that possibly Thomas Jefferson had sexual relations with his slave, Sally he Hemings. Um, in this picture over here, we see the slave woman, the two children of the slave owner, and the slave owner himself. 
What's odd is we do not see the wife. We don't know much about this family. All we do know is that the wife isn't there, but the black female slave is. So the question is, was she sexually exploited? What was her job? Was she to take care of the kids and the household and be almost like a wife? We really don't know, but um, it usually was the case, like I said before, that the black female slave was sexually exploited, especially if she worked in the home. Marriage, slave marriage was illegal, but slaves had their own ritual to get married and it was known as jumping the broom. Um, so slaves found ways around these, um, these laws and these views of them as being lesser than or as being almost like inanimate objects. Um, Slave women who gave birth um, dealt with this concept of feeling hopeless because they knew that their baby would be born into slavery. And it was their job to make sure that they taught their child survival skills and also to remember that they weren't chattel, that they were human beings. <clears throat> and unlike... Um, the women who fit the stereotype of the ideology of true womanhood, slave women didn't have that, um, that privilege that they could just have all of these children born into um, nice homes and, and have the freedom and have the extra money. They didn't have that, that special freedom and liberty with their children to be that type of a mother. They were excluded from that true womanhood. Um, so what were the views of slave women? The stereotype, well, like I said before, inanimate objects. Not even human. They were sold like they were chattel. No worth or rates, and that especially was indicated when they were sexually exploited. Um, the feeling of no worth or rates and they were a danger to society. The woman of the household married to the slave owner would most likely view the slave woman possibly as a danger because she was another female in the home that posed a threat and possibly her husband would wander away and have sex with her instead of the wife. On their so here we have Native American women and their identity, and we see that the expansion of southern the southern slave system led to the more domination, or excuse me, led to more domination of Native American land. So, the expansion of slavery and plantation in the Lower South led to the U.S. government taking more Native American lands, so that they would be able to grow more of this cotton rice, sugar, etc. Um, but with the, the seizure of Native American lands, we also see that there was an end to Native American culture. Let's focus on the Cherokee people. When Andrew Jackson was president, he uh, put into place the Indian, or helped put into place the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which forced the Cherokee people to leave their land and go west of the Mississippi River um, in which they would be established into different territory where they had to live and the Cherokee called this the Trail of Tears. The land that was seized by the government was used to grow cotton and tobacco uh, via slave labor. So the removal of this land and the loss of the Cherokee uh, culture led 13 Cherokee women to petition their Cherokee National Council to say, hey, we've had enough. We have to stop the government from taking our Native American land. These women represented days gone by when women in the Native American culture 
shared the social and political authority with men. But once the government came in and once the white, you know, if you want to say the white man came in and took the land, they also took away the culture that made up the Native Americans. And so the women showed that they, they had been giving up their values and culture to amalgamate with American domesticity. In conclusion, in conclusion, this concept of the ideology of true womanhood seemed to place domestic women um, at the very top of American society. But in reality, um, little did they know back in the, you know, the 1800s that women workers, uh, so industrialization, and also slave women were going to be the dynamic force that would shape the early American nation and also foreshadow crisis that would come in the future. Possibly falling in love, having a child out of wedlock, can't afford the, the cost of living and food and taking care of the child, and so a character like Fantine uh, working in the factory, she was discovered. Um, and so you see the warden uh, admonishing her. She fired her because, oh my gosh, she, she's not a moral woman. And she had a child out of wedlock. How dare she? And also she lied to everyone and, and no one knew what was going on. And so if you know anything about Les Miserables, you read it, you saw the movie, there's different versions. Um, she goes on, she's fired, what does she have to do? She has to make ends meet. So you see her cutting off her hair, selling her teeth for money, her hair for money, her teeth for money, sleeping with the, um, the, the uh, tenant of the apartment, prostitution to make ends meet. Um, I don't want to make you sad and ruin your day, but she ends up contracting a disease and, and dying. Um, so, you know, this is just a little glimpse into the woman worker and what she experienced. I'm not saying all, but this definitely was the case for some.